Hello, my name is John Brink and we are on the Brink podcasting from the capital of Northern BC, Prince George. Beautiful day in Prince George. It's uh, late April, spring is around the corner and it's going to be a beautiful, beautiful summer. I have a special guest today and a friend, her name is Donna Flood. Donna, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, John. Beautiful up here. What a great view you've got. I do. And we, we're sitting downtown Prince George at the fourth level of this building and we're looking over virtually downtown Prince George. Yeah, we can see the mayor's office right from and, your room. And, keep and an we, eye. We keep an eye on them. <laughs> you know. So uh, tell me a little bit about your past. Wow, I thought we only had an hour. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, um, I have, some people know, some people don't know. I'm a nurse by profession. Okay. Um, that's what my profession is. And um, actually this June, I'm coming up to my 40th um, anniversary graduation. So I've been a nurse for over 40 years. Wow. Yeah, so that's a long time. Um, Florence was not in my class, but uh, pretty close. Right. So anyway, so um, I started out in pediatrics. That was my profession. I worked at Sick Kids in Toronto. What is pediatrics? Pediatrics is children. Okay. So I worked at Sick Children in Toronto for okay. a few years. And, Were you born uh, there? Or? Yep, just outside of Toronto. I was okay. born. I am uh, got two brothers, two sisters, okay. and we're all pretty close. My mom had uh, five children, all under the age of six. Okay. So we were wow. a busy family, right? Yeah, yeah. And pretty close. So, yeah. um, so grew up in Oakville, just outside of Toronto, and um, ended up going to Sick Kids in Toronto, which right. was um, a really great experience. I mean, it was sure. um, pretty one of the top children's hospital in the world. So we had people flying in from all over the world, bringing in their children and whatnot. So it was a great experience. Lived right downtown Toronto at that time. So right. at that time in my life, it was just just a great place to be, right? right. So. Right. And then um, from there, I had an opportunity to go and work in Bermuda. As Bermuda, a nurse. why? Uh, why not? It's yeah. Bermuda. Well, I mean, I'm coming from... <laughs> yeah. So when yeah. was that? That was, um, oh, don't, I can't remember the year, probably 80, 88? 88, yeah. 89, and stayed there for about five, five or six years. Five or six, um, and again, being uh, in nursing? In nursing. Um, pediatrics in particular? In, in pediatrics as well. Yeah. And um, so again, in sort of um, respect of our healthcare system, it was um, accredited by Canadian standards, right? Okay. Around the world, people look to Canada for that sort of health accreditation. Wow. So, um, you know, so it was familiar, right? Yeah. As far as how they did their work and all yeah, of yeah. that sort of stuff. And it was just a lot of fun. Yeah. You know, it was a lot of fun, a lot of expat populations all over the world. Everybody was coming in to, to yeah. live in Bermuda. And it was sort of a gateway to the rest of the Caribbean yeah. and, and all of that. So, yeah. so, yeah. How, so five years. And then where did you go from there? Then I took an opportunity um, to travel. And um, I spent a year going across Africa. And Africa. that was right from um, Morocco down through Mali and across out through Tanzania. Wow. And it took about a year to get through. Wow. So I was with a group. There was about uh, 10 of us that went through and we were just in a overland type, type of truck. Right. So. Um, what, what year was that? Early again, that 90s? was in the early 90s. That was in sort of the height of the AIDS epidemic. Okay. You know, so you could really see um, the devastation that yeah, that yeah. had caused in Africa. You would go through villages that were empty because yeah. everyone literally had died. Yeah. Or you would see people dying on the street Whoa. and in their villages. They really didn't understand how it transmitted. Right. They thought that there was conspiracy from America, that America yeah. had brought it to them. So it was Uganda that probably... Um, was leading um, the the continent in AIDS information and trying to get people to understand and offer the protection. So it was um, really quite um, mind opening to see, you know, how devastating it was. Right. Were you then 
acting as a nurse or being hired as a nurse? No, I didn't. I didn't work there. There would be yeah. certain villages we would go into and I would nurse in the sense that they had nothing. So we right. had whatever we would have. We, yeah. you know, whatever medications. So, so we'd support people along the way, but right. um, wasn't my wasn't what I was there to do. I was right. there more traveling and having that sort of adventure right. and stuff. But um, you can't help but, you know, support people when you see that sort well, of yeah. devastation. So and devastating. For us, culturally, um, AIDS really created a hole in our arts and our, you know, sure. that all, all of our arts community, you know, were affected. Yeah. So there's huge decades where we miss that. Yeah. But there you're seeing you know, communities and villages gone. God, totally yeah, gone. Yeah, yeah. Hard to imagine, right? It really is hard to imagine. I mean, we knew what we knew, but to see it on that other level was, yeah. yeah so. But now totally managed virtually, right? Wow. What the, how they've come to create it, it's like a chronic disease now. People are right. no longer dying, yeah. you know, and people now understand and, you know, so yeah. we, we've come through it, but it was certainly, it was the pandemic of the 90s, oh, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, worldwide, so, right? Yeah. So then where did you go from there? Now, this is, this is my most um, proudest part I was. I, so I went and my next thing was to travel through India, right? Yeah. So, um, you know, you get those little um, Lonely Planet books, go and go to the Taj Mahal, go to yeah, Varanasi, yeah. do all of that. And one was to go to Calcutta and spend a week um, at a hospice there, which was Mother Teresa's hospice. Yeah. So I thought, oh, I'll go do that. That's kind of a cool thing to go yeah. do. And uh, so when I got there, um, again, it was overwhelming. It was overwhelming to see, you know, how poor people are and how little health care there was. And when she found out I was a nurse, she asked if I would stay. Yeah. So I ended up staying a year and supporting um, her novice nuns and helping them learn some nursing care and stuff like that. But it was it was life changing. Yeah. Can, can you imagine that encountering so, somebody like her? Mm hmm. Didn't she get a Nobel Prize? She got a Nobel Peace Prize. Yeah. She's a saint. Yeah. Very few people. A, a so recognized soon, saint. So, right? so soon after they die, become a saint. Mother so, Teresa. Yeah. Yeah. So amazing. She always kind of, if I still picture her as somebody amazing, she seems so small and fragile. She was tiny. And I think that's... When you think of um, the sort of holiness about her and the saintliness about her, um, she was very tiny. She was very tiny. She was very humble. And sometimes when you meet great people, there's a charisma about them. There's an aura about them. And you feel something. She is the example of that, right? No, she's not. No. And that was the, the sort of miracle of her yeah. is that she truly felt she was a vessel to do good. Her work was what her her strength was yeah. she never took ownership of that herself she was very yeah. humble yeah. um very um soft yeah um but also very clear and very strict with what she needed to have done for the people so that she cared were for you around her for about a year yeah, yeah. I didn't An see her every day. Amazing experience but, that affected yeah. you for the rest of your life. I'm yeah. Sure. Well, what what I think it was probably the start that put a little bit of hospice in me was um, what care and compassion can do yeah. is far bigger than what the best medicine can do. Yeah. You know, she had nothing. She didn't. No. If it wasn't expired or used, we didn't have it, right? Yeah. But my goodness, they took those people off the street and they loved them and cared for them. And yeah. You know, and they got better. So, when was this? Was it in 2000 already? No, it was. It would have been the late 90s. Late 90s. The late yeah, 90s. I'm trying to keep track of it. Yeah, the I know. Well, and, yeah. So, yeah. so, I know. So, it's, what happened then? So then, see, I'm so lucky. I'll tell you. If you have daughters, get them to be nurses. It's such an awesome career to be able right. to travel. So, right. She came to me one day and she sort of said, is there not something else you can do? Like, there's people in Canada, you know, in the high north, you should go there. And so I did. I went and worked in the high Arctic. I worked in um, Nunavut. 
and I spent 10 years Nunavik there. Nunavik is in... Nunavik is its own territory now. It's yeah. split, um, I don't know, probably about maybe 10 years ago and yeah. became its own independent. Yeah. It was Northwest Territories when yeah. I first went up there. Yeah. And so I was in a little village called Baker Lake. Yeah. And that's where I nursed. And it Close was... Close to Yellowknife? No, it was um, much higher north yeah. than the Close Yellowknife. Close to the Arctic Circle? It was just underneath it. I then moved to Cambridge Bay, which was above the Arctic Circle. The land of the midnight sun. Yeah. Oh, yeah, where it was, you know, um, all day for two months and yeah. all night for two months. Yeah. yeah, I had a touch of that in Watson yeah. Lake and the Yukon. Yeah, not quite the same, but close to it. You know, it, you know what? It, it's so lot, like the expanse is huge. So wherever you go above that parallel, it's the same. Yeah, you know, the only thing is we didn't have any of the trees. It was strictly tundra. Yeah, and all of that, right? But yeah. um, was very much connected with the Inuit people, yeah. which. Again, beautiful culture of people. They were yeah. just lovely. They're very soft, very kind. They were still living off the land at that point. Yeah. So, you know, so that they were still hunting and... So that was early 2000? That would have been a late 90s. Yeah, late so 90s. The end of, yeah. So what were you doing there then? Um, the I went up as a nurse and then I became the director of health and social services. So I oversaw the health care for the territory. Yeah. So supported um, just the whole health care system at that point. So Quite a job. It was quite a job, right? I mean... You know yourself, John, uh, about the courage of stepping outside of your country. I exactly. mean, you did that. How old were you when you 24. left? 24. 24, yeah. yeah. Into, you didn't know what you were going into, right? I had into, no idea. Right? Came off the bus mm -hmm. here, about two blocks away from here. Had no idea. Stepped off the bus in my gray pants, my raincoat, my suitcase. Couldn't speak the language, didn't know soul at $25.47. Yeah. But I had a dream. Well, not only that, you have courage. And when people ask me, you know, how, how did you manage? Because I did this all on my own. I was not with a husband or if, with my family. I was on my own. Um, it's courage. Yeah. It's having the courage to go through the door. Not just, yeah. you know, seeing the doors that are open, but go through that door. Exactly. And that's, you know, what you had to have, yeah. right? That same courage. Exactly. So. Yeah. Amazing experience, though, in a way, mm -hmm. and uh, especially looking back, and uh, you know, so so then you were in the in Northwest Territories, mm -hmm. or uh, how do you call the other one? Nunavik. Nunavik, uh, and how long were you there? I was there for ten years, and that's, that's a long time. Though, it that's... was. I know it was a long time, and then um, it was my fortieth birthday, so I'm up there at forty. And, and I said this to other people, it was like, I forgot to get married. So that was like, oh, now. So uh, that's when I met Frank. And you've met Frank. He Damn. was working up there. He was doing the, um, the computers and the telehealth and all of that. And I met him up there. And um, yeah. we actually had a traditional Inuit wedding, which yeah. was beautiful. Yeah. And um, then had the children. I didn't have my first child till I was 42 and then had my second at 44. So your oldest daughter is Mary? Mary, yeah. And, yeah. and Elam is Liam. Your, yep. Liam is the son, mm -hmm. a, a couple of years younger than Mary. Mary mm -hmm. is about 18, 19. Or? You're right on. Good for yeah. you, John. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah. 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 So, the, uh, so th that's where you created a family. I did, yeah. And, and then... So they were there for a period, then obviously Frank was in, quite involved. Mm -hmm. And then at some point you decided to leave there and you want to... We, we decided on BC. Both of us were from Ontario Yeah, and grew up in Ontario. But yeah. um, we decided that BC was where we really wanted to raise our family, right? right. This was where we were going to put our roots. Yeah. And we felt that it just had a lot more to offer. Um, yeah. I certainly wasn't prepared to go back to the city, you know, no. going back to Toronto no. or Not Southern after Ontario, all of this, right? right? No. Yeah. So, um, so we we actually went initially to Rosalind. I don't know in the Kootenays. Yeah. It's in near Trail. It's close to yeah, yeah Trail, right? Yeah. Yeah. So I was director of the hospital at Trail. Yeah. 
Um, and Frank stayed home and cared for the kids, which yeah. is pretty awesome. He yeah. was the, you know, the the stay at home, which gave me the opportunity to do my work. Yeah, go and, back into the nursing. And so he has a relationship with the children that, you know, I think most men don't get to have because he no. was there. Yeah. You know, and then he finally said, I'm done. Yeah. You know, so I said, well, you find the job and we'll go. And yeah. he got the job here in Prince George. And that was 2002? That would have been 2000... No, 12. And no, 2012 12. or something 12. like yeah, yeah, I think. Yeah, so yeah. the... Uh, so, so he got a job where... With Northern Health. He Which does telehealth. He does the virtual care so physicians yeah. can see. Yeah. Yeah, remotely and stuff like that. So. Yeah. And, and, and so that was even then quite a switch for you because even Prince George, by comparison to where you had been, mm -hmm. was big. Oh, especially the well, region. <laughs> I remember people, like especially in China, oh, you don't want to go to Prince George, it's cold there. And I'm like, oh no, I know cold. You don't know cold. <laughs> no. And, um, you know, it's, it's a city enough, but it's small enough. Yeah. You know, and I think... Perfect. Um, when you think of, you know, sort of how you want to create a business, yeah. you know everybody, right? Yeah. But yeah. you can still get lost, Yeah, you know? Yeah. So Prince George is at that stage. It's about, for our guests that are watching, it's about 75,000, 80,000 mm -hmm. uh, uh, people. You know, when I came here in 1965, uh, nearly 57 years ago, looking here okay. where we are sitting would be downtown. It was a, a boom town. Mm -hmm. And, and the, the normal dialogue was, when did you get here? And when are you leaving? Yeah. You know, so where now that has totally changed. It has become an amazing city and the region. Uh, you know, we have a university, we have college, uh, we have right behind us, you see a picture of a new swimming pool. Uh, you know, it has become the ideal family town where you can bring up a family and, and, and find careers yeah. here, actually. And, uh, well, it, you would have been right when it being a crossroads was really significant yes. to, to the economy and the yes. industry and just even being able to vitalize the North. Like, yes. So what was it like to, to be in that hub space back in the 60s when really Prince George was the place to, you know, crossroad everywhere. Well, yeah, it uh, was, was a boom town. And, uh, you know, for me, it was ideal because I wanted to build a lumber mill mm -hmm. and they were doing that here. And so I kind of looked at it as that's where my career will be. And then from there and then I'm going to build a mill, you know, yeah. it, uh, don't know how, but it didn't have any money. And, uh, but I know <laughs> yeah, 25 it was, bucks. <laughs> yeah, 25 <laughs> bucks, 47 yeah. cents, you know, so uh, yeah, it was the ideal city then. So then, then you, st uh, again, Frank was then working for uh, Northern Health and then mm -hmm. you, what did, what? I, I was brought on by Northern Health. I did some projects there, and then I was director of the hospital for a short time. Um, but while I was at Northern Health, I was um, brought on to do a project and bring palliative care to Prince George to get a process for palliative care uh, to be supported here. Now, and, now, again, for our guests, oh. saying, what is palliative care? Okay, palliative care is care that you give um, to ensure that there's quality of life. It's not curative care. Yeah. So it's care so that as someone that maybe have a life ending illness, yeah. transitions so that they're supported as far as their symptoms. Yeah. They're not necessarily at end of life, no. but they just know that they're not going to get better or right. they'll die of whatever disease they have. So right. it's giving people support right. in, in that transition. So that's when I got introduced to the, our hospice here. Right. Right. And right. I had not really seen how a hospice worked in Canada before. Yeah. And really, um, you know, how the care is very different. Right. It's very supportive. It's very um, slow and relaxed versus, right. you know, the energy around curing people. Right. Right. Um, and so 
I became a part of their board. I became a board of uh, director on the board, right? Um, because I thought it was important to support this. Yeah. And then the opportunity came that the executive director retired, right. and I applied. Yeah. And I, I think everything that I had done had sort of led me to that. Y you, you were know? perfectly skilled for it. You had the foundation of being a nurse. And then all the other exposure yeah. you had in mm. Africa, northern Canada, mm. and all those areas made you a perfect choice. Well, just realizing how when we care for people, it's more than just um, the person itself. It's their family. It's those around right. them. It's right. sometimes uh, the guest in our house. We call them guests because it's our home. Yeah. And there are our invited guests. Their family and friends. Yeah get the care, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, because that's who needs it. Yeah. Now, obviously we've known each other already for mm -hmm. quite a number of years and uh, you know, the, and I've done tours of your mm -hmm. facility. Was it already then that location? Well, yeah, it was that location. We were the very first hospice house in all of BC. Yeah. We were the first one. Amazing. Which is amazing. So the people, the founders of hospice, um, in this community had the foresight to realize how important it is. Yeah. And the Rotarians had been fundraising for the cancer center. Yeah. We had been promised the cancer center, then um, the Ministry of Health pulled it from us and gave it to Kelowna. Yeah. So the Not Rotarians, nice. I know, that's, no. that's the story of Prince George, right? <laughs> so, but we locked out and they gave the money to hospice and we yeah. were able to buy the first house. Yeah. So, Which is still the existing one today. And so it is, and we've added on to it. Different. Yeah, yeah, we've added on to it. Yeah. Then it was only five beds. We had a nurse around the clock, but it was volunteers that did all the other care. It was volunteers that came and did the personal care and washed people and yeah. cooked the meals and did the housekeeping. Yeah. So there was a huge team of volunteers that yeah. made that happen. So you Still can, today, though. Eh? We still have a huge team, but now we have... Um, caregivers that are in their care aides and nurses that provide So how many care. beds do you have now? We have 10. 10. And, and where does your funding come from? Well, um, a lot from you, John. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> it, it comes, we get some funding from Northern Health. Northern Health um, provides funding for a Rotary Hospice House only. Right. Um, and they now support 70%, which is Fabulous, you yeah. know that that's new, and we're very grateful for that. Yeah. So which, that's only recently. That's only recently, um, but it allows us now to do our other programs. Yeah. And that's one of the things I don't know if the community is aware of how much we reach into the community to support people in their homes or people that are grieving um, caregivers. One of the hardest things is caring for someone that is ill at home and you become isolated because you can no longer have the same sort of social connections um, and things like that. So it reaches, now you're yeah. moving in to an area beyond palliative care. Well, it's still palliative care because yeah, but, but But also yeah. further beyond that, yeah. right? In terms of that, uh, as you said, people that are caregivers yeah. or people that have been exposed to trauma of some sort that need help, or maybe even today in particular, where COVID has been so yeah. hard on so many people. Well, we were, um, we got introduced to a friend of mine who had um, COVID long haulers, and it was so profound, you know, just how life-changing it was, um, that how he described it was going from 50 to 70 overnight. So these people, like especially in the early stages, remember, they were so sick, they were handed a phone in an ICU to say, make the phone calls, you may not survive this. And yeah. they're alone yeah. with no family. Because and nobody then, could come in. Well, you couldn't come in, right? No. And so, so they have that trauma and then they recover, but they never really recover because no. some of them have a chronic illness now where they just don't have the energy. Yeah. Some of them, you know, just getting out of bed in the morning is all they can do. And, and that, these are vibrant people like you or I that get up every day and do, and but can't. that's called long... COVID long haulers. 
COVID co- long hauling. Yeah. Yeah. And so we um, started a group for them so that they yeah. could at least connect with each other. And we have people um, videoing in, like from Vancouver, to be part of this group. Wow. You know, so far right now, it's the only peer support group that's right. out there. Um, and that's, you know, the magic of the Prince George Hospice Society is that our staff pivot and adjust to whatever's needed. Yeah. It's never a thing about that's not our role. No. It's like, okay, how do we now support these people? Yeah. Um, similar, the, um, the opioid crisis. Yeah. It's a whole group of people that are grieving for their lost children. Yeah. And there's so much stigma around it, you know, yeah. that... Um, they don't get the support that you would get if your child died in a car accident, exactly. right? And so we have the opioid support group to help support them so that, you know, they feel connected. Yeah, because a lot of times people don't even know about it that the people living on the corner there lost their son, daughter yeah. at a very young age and people don't really find out about it because yeah. it's not involving a physical accident other it's yeah. you know. or because it's stigmatized because well they were taking drugs you know that's what happens you yeah. know but that's still not okay that someone's no. child right yeah. yeah so um so i'm very fortunate that um the hospice staff are unbelievable yeah it's always how can we help yeah you know yeah now the other thing that you've been doing is you've been uh, you know on hospice is you one of the areas before the government stepped in, which is only in the last year mm-hmm. or two, uh, you were fundraising in another way in which uh, you had to be innovative, right? And, oh, and, yeah. and so, and you had to be an entrepreneur and... Uh, well, this and, was and, the one thing I did not have any experience in. It was like, yeah. oh yeah, I can run a hospice. Fundraising is a whole new kettle of fish. Yeah. And then trying to raise money for... Oh, the place where people die? Yeah. Yeah, no one wants yeah. to talk That's to you about the, that. I always used to yeah. say when you pass it, you look this way, not that way. Yeah, you know, because, so, yeah. but um, I have been very, very fortunate that um, a lot of people came and supported me um, in how to get my message out and what things to do. Um, so I had uh, fundraising 101 and social media and marketing 101 by my very good friend scott mcwalter who was instrumental in helping me figure out that new whole way to get people's attention and not have them turn away so um i have relied heavily on people in the community like you john that have stepped up when whenever we've asked a dream home a dream home lottery is not easy no no. Um, it takes a, a whole community to build the house yeah. and provide the support and then the skill of selling tickets yeah. um, for a cause that initially people were frightened to talk about. I think yeah. we managed to turn the community's heart and see hospice as a bright thing and yeah. not a scary thing. Yeah, right? and, and, and what you build around you is a team of mm-hmm. individuals, uh, yep. you know, uh, people like Scott, myself and other people on our yep. team. Uh, David McMalton, another fellow that uh, was very, yeah. very, and has been very active in believing in the cause, into saying, hey guys, we're going to make this a success. Yeah. Well, you and know. you know, and you've learned probably, I'm shameless. Yeah. You know, um, I ask for help. I ask for people to come because, yeah. you know, it is a community hospice. We have um, tried to create events that also engage the community and that are fun. Yeah. And that they're a reason to get out and, yeah. and enjoy yourself and remember people. Um, the really big, exciting win we have coming up is the Color Walk. Color Walk. Of which, again, thank you, John, you're the host sponsor. But um, How many years done it? Four years? We're four. This is our fourth year. Yeah. We started it in 2019, and that's where we yeah. had it up at the university. Yeah. And at that point, it was just an event. It was a day event. Yeah. And it was like the... Um, Huli colors, which is colored powder that you throw. Yeah, yeah. And the whole premise was to celebrate life and remember and, people. And to remember yeah. somebody special. Yeah, let's let's remember the vibrance yeah. of life. Um, yeah. And so it was a huge success. Yeah. It was so much fun. We had a petting zoo. We had a jumpy yeah. castle. We had food. Yeah. And it was just a great event. And then COVID hit. Yeah. 
And so that was like, oh, we don't want to lose. But now this. we back down mm-hmm. again at Will yep. Start. When is it? But it's no, it's what it is. It's a month long now. Yeah. Instead of a one day event, exactly. it's an opportunity for the community to engage with each other, yeah. get out, enjoy, you know, the beautiful parks we have in exactly. Prince George. Yeah. Um, you know, if you're in, in gratitude to hospice and hospice's support, yeah. get out and pledge. Um, raise money for hospice, but share your stories. Yeah. And then, well, Sandra is so creative in creating yeah. different events. We've got scavenger hunts. We've got different things yeah. to do. So it's for the family. Yeah. And yeah, exactly. it's a family way of, you know, let's remember grandpa. Grandpa's favorite color was blue. So we're going to wear blue and it's, we're going to yeah, talk yeah. about all the great things, yeah. you know, that exactly. and share the stories. And then it's going to, on May 29th, have at the CN parking lot. Yeah. That will be our color event where you can come between 10 and 12 on yeah. May 29th. Walk our loop. The colors will be thrown and it's just another great family yeah. fun day event yeah it's same day as the um climb for cancer so people come and do your color walk and go and climb for cancer right um all of our um charities and not-for-profits need the community support now yeah. more than ever right yeah no i agree with that so you know so, so the, now the other thing that uh You've been active and you're also on the Chamber of Commerce. I am. I am. I think it's really important that not-for-profits are our businesses too. And we need to have a voice at the table and talk about what are the needs of the not-for-profit segment. I think that um, I live in this community. I rely on this community yeah. to support hospice. So I think it's important to get out there and do the work to, yeah. to create this town into something we're proud of. So, so how long have you been on the Chamber of This will be just one year. Yeah. Um, so I'll stay on and yeah. uh, do what we can do. Um, it's important work. Yeah, it is because uh, Chamber of Commerce is very much part of this community, as it is in other places. But uh, we, we are very lucky to have a very active Chamber of Commerce. Lots of participation, <laughs> lots of initiatives that uh, directly relate to the community. Well, and, and what they do, they get their hands dirty. They're out there working. Yeah. They're a working board. They're thinking up marketing strategies. They're thinking yeah. of ways to support the community. They're not just out there as sort of armchair quarterbacks, yeah. you know, with with concerns. They're out there doing the work, offering solutions, and trying to be part of the solution. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So uh, now, you know, that's keeps you also busy in addition to all the other mm. things that you're doing already. Yeah. And and then the other thing that I'm just kind of wondering, like with the palliative service uh, and, uh, you know, since you were one of the first ones in the Prince George Palliative Care Society was one of the first ones in the province, is there any interaction between the different Mm-hmm. areas or how does that work well yeah so we we, we have the um, BC Hospice Palliative Care Association and okay. that um, has 70 different hospices 70 70 different hospices across the province now some of them are just a lady sitting at her kitchen table trying to support their community and when people yeah. are dying at home two big ones like us in Victoria Hospice so I'm the president of that association oh, you are. and on the Canadian Hospice Palliative Care Association so that Prince George has a present. We um, are seen as a center of excellence. Right. And we are so privileged to have what we have. Um, and we have it only because the community has said that it's important. Right. right? Yeah. Um, and so I think it's, it's our duty to go and help support others. We've yeah. now started reaching out to the northern excuse me, the northern um, communities and giving them education. We have um, education virtually to support their volunteers. We're offering them solutions for fundraising just because, again, we're, we're in a position of privilege here, right? Yeah. So I always kind of look at Prince George as the, uh, as I said in the introduction, is the capital of northern BC or the other half of the province. Yeah. And, and to my friends down south, I remind them that 80% of the GDP 
is coming from yeah. northern BC, and I just want to make sure that you don't forget that. You <laughs> yeah. know, so, and yeah. uh, you know, so the the other one is palliative. Uh, you know, the, the the region that you cover is not limited to Prince George, right? We well, we because the the nature of palliative care is not just about the person, but it's about the families. Right. We we've taken people into the house because their families live here. So maybe right. your mom has come from Ontario. Okay. Uh, because so that she can be and die close, close to, their, to family their family because you know it's 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 about the connectedness. Um, okay. so and we we accept people from right across the north, um, especially with our community programs. Um, now that we the one unintended con um, actually um, Thing we should be grateful for for COVID is the way virtual um, interaction has right. happened, right? So we can virtually support anybody anywhere. Right. right. And so again, we connect to all of our northern communities and whatnot. Yeah. So. What is the, you know, the, the, fortunately, I have not been, I've been close to you mm -hmm. and to uh, the hospice's care, obviously, uh, you know, with the fundraising and all those kind of things, but. You know, what, what are the challenges usually of people that contemplate as they, how do they go about, you can't just pick up the phone and say, hi, hello, here well, I am. The, the biggest challenge is death is scary. Death yeah. is scary. People yeah. don't want to talk about it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's really hard for physicians to talk about it and tell someone yeah. that, you know, there's nothing more we can do for you yeah. um, and letting them know. But there's also a beauty of going into those doors is saying, okay, this is where we're at. Now we can have those conversations. Right. We don't have to tiptoe around it. We can, right. you know, do the things we need to do. Um, so if one of the things I can do is to help us understand that death is not as scary and that we can, you know, move into it in a way that, you know, um, certainly nobody wants to die. Nobody yeah. wants you know, to lose their dad or anything like no. that. But let's help everybody through that journey so that they can say the things they need to say, do the things they need to do. Yeah. Um, one of the big things we're doing is we've got this new manual. It's called Good To Go. And what it is, is that it's a way to make sure you have everything in order, yeah. right? That I look at Scott. Scott has a child. Has he looked to see what would happen if he should die tomorrow? Does is he good to go? Does he have everything in order? Right. Do people know what um, his his assets are? Where they want to go? Right. How he wants have to be will. buried? The um, we did a big project with the university, the UNBC. Thank goodness we're a university town. And we did a whole bunch of focus groups and we went to different groups and we said, um, what's really important to you in case you die tomorrow? So we went up to the university and to the students there because uh, we want to know what what's important to them. Make sure someone could erase their computer at before any, their mom came. At any <laughs> age, right? Yeah. You don't have to be old to have a will. Well, that, and it's more important when I look at Andrew and you've got children who will care for your children, who will do all of that. Do you have it in order? Because then you don't have to worry about it again. Right. You've asked those questions. You've talked about it. You've had the candid conversations. Um, I grew up in a household where my mother was, she would talk about what she wanted in case she died. I mean, my mother is 92 and, um, she puts a bottle of wine away every month for her wake. Well, now we're running out of space for her wine. <laughs> so, yeah. but you know what? We know exactly what she wants, right? Yeah. And um, my children know exactly what I want. Yeah. And so once you have those conversations, then as things change, it's not so hard. No. And it makes it a lot of times much harder and then potentially even harder again that if there are assets or if there are things that have not been willed or talked about in terms of what the person that owned it had in mind with mm -hmm. it, so important. But it, it, Well, it breaks families up, Yeah, you know, if it it's does. not clearly done. And so it what does. we want is we want that done, comfortable to have the conversation. And our commitment is to whoever has this book is we're going to contact you once a year. We're going to say, Hey, John, has anything changed? Yeah. Just make sure you've, you've yeah. 
got it updated. Yeah. We're going to have it virtual so you can have it all up in a cloud and yeah. you can send it to your kids or whatever. So that's our next little bit of work. So yeah. we want people to have the conversation and not be so scary. Yeah. Yeah. You know? and, and, and that is removing the stigma and the myth right around it because part of living mm -hmm. Is dying. Well, right? I haven't. Well, I think yesterday the oldest man in the world just died in Japan, 117. Yeah. But very few of us are going to avoid it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's, I'm happy to avoid it for a while, but I, yeah. you know, it's it's, it's what certain, it is, right? Virtually, it's right. certain. So let's let's. Um, I used to put a picture on all of my presentations and it was um, the birth of a baby. Yeah. It was actually the birth of your baby that was on my slides, a violet. And this whole family is there, all beaming and excited and part of a birth. We're not like that with death. No. You know, we should. We should know what we want, how we want it. You know, what, what do you want that to look like so that... You know, when the time, I'll plan it now so that in 50 years, it's not going to be scary for my family. And, and that's what I do too, mm -hmm. is, uh, you know, that uh, I talk to my family about our assets or uh, let them know what, uh, you know, what is happening in my life. Mm -hmm. And we try to do at least once a year a meeting about mm -hmm. that, update them and, uh, and at the same time try to or have a will that kind of deals with but if if something happens because the the, the it, it would be devastating to think that if i didn't do that it could create a riff in yeah. the family that i could have avoided but you've done something else equally as important you've yeah. left a legacy book yeah you know having that book tells your story yeah. right so your kids may know some of it they probably didn't know the details that no. you've written out right so that leaves yeah. a legacy for your family to say this is what my grandfather did this is yeah. the story of my great grandfather's life and it becomes the legacy and i think yeah. it's important for people to share their stories yeah. everybody has a story Right? Yeah, and they don't necessarily have to write a book like nope. I did. I wrote another one actually. It's coming out. I July know the it's 8th. ADHD. <laughs> yeah. I I have a son, my Liam. You know, so yeah. so and I'm gonna give you a copy <laughs> of it and sign yeah. for sure. You know the so the but but just kind of following through on that is saying that you don't have to necessarily write a book, but then if you can, beautiful. You know, but at least video. Mm -hmm. You know, where some, they have a discussion, like you and me are sitting mm -hmm. here, you know, and saying, uh, let's talk about things in life, what have you done, what have you gone, tell us a little bit more. Because, uh, you know, I remember even from my parents, uh, you know, they, uh, you know, were from, more or less, I love them dearly, but, you know, they uh, went through a difficult time, First, Second World mm -hmm. War, and then uh, were born during the First World War and then uh, had gone through a lot of trauma and uh, but at the same time you know the, there was not all that much hugging and saying yeah. I love you and all. But life all, is hard. Yeah and, and uh, you know and, and then talking about things that may or may not happen mm -hmm. th these conversations were non-existent in most yeah. cases we are now hopefully that will become more of uh, people's dialogue if they, mm -hmm. uh, you know, at any age and saying, uh, I have to prepare for what may or may not happen. And, and the more yeah. I can leave behind and saying, you know, something, uh, you know, let's kind of look at these videos where we are, have a discussion with Pete, mm -hmm. John, or whatever his name is, uh, that we did way back then and to for you, grandchild that is maybe not born yeah. yet, that you get to know them. Yep. So important. Well, right? I think, you know, and uh, again, I'm going to be shameless. I think we should get out there and encourage parents to have their children interview their grandparents. I yeah. think it's a campaign we should do. I love you it. You know, let's, how do we get people to sh share the legacy, I become love it. part of the legacy? Because you've done it, you know how important it is. Yeah. You know, and um, it then gets those kids asking questions. We've just done up a legacy booklet for guests in our house 
so they can come and ask questions. How do people get a hold of some? Because people that they, are listening yeah. to us now are saying Well, I think yeah. it's something, because we were just leaving it for our guests, but maybe it should be something for everybody. Yeah. You know, let's ask our grandmothers, you know, um, what was your first job? Or yeah. what was your first kiss? Or, yeah. you know, all of those things that w are getting lost. Yeah, and it should not happen, no. right? Because, no. because for sure... The argument will be later is uh, we should have done that, but we didn't do it. And I'm so sorry I didn't. Right? Yeah. And one of the things we know at hospice, woulda, shoulda, couldas, you know, um, if you think it, do it. There, yeah. There's no, there's no procrastination in life anymore. It's no. too, it's brief. Yeah. Yeah. And it happens when you least expect yeah. it. Right. And I would have never thought that this would happen, you know, yeah. you know, so the, uh, so the other thing, uh, you know, the uh, so y you're a very, very active individual, uh, you know, like, uh, you know, with your involvement in the national palliative mm -hmm. care mm -hmm. uh, approach and as well as regional and, uh, you know, the, uh, so is there more happening in northern BC uh, beyond here, like Fort Nelson? Uh, Takla and some well, of the that's First we, Nations. And we've, we've created this um, collaborative of all of them in the north yeah. that we meet with them monthly. We talk about okay. commonalities, how we can support them, how we can educate them and all of that, right? Because we, like I said, we're very, very privileged here. Yeah. And so I think um, you shouldn't um, be denied the same hospice support and care yeah. just because you live in Fort Nelson. Right. You know, how do we make sure? And hospice care doesn't have to happen in our house. No. Hospice care is how we share our heart and how we give compassion. You can do that in people's home. You can do that in hospitals. Yeah. You know, just that holistic approach of caring, right? Yeah. So. Yeah. Does that mean also that... Uh, Hospitals usually are not, and doctors, with all due respect to my friends, yeah. doctors, really don't have the skill sets to deal with the... Or They're people, getting better. They're yeah. getting better. Yeah. But, you know, everything about them is about getting people better. Yeah. Getting people better and, and this cured. This doesn't come and natural. So when right. you... It almost sometimes for them is, oh, I failed. Yeah. Well, death is not failure. Death, yeah. death is what happens, right? Yeah. And so... Yeah. The kindness is to say, this is now the next thing we can do, yeah. and hospice palliative care can help. Yeah. 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 The other thing I just wanted to talk to you about, the, uh, you have two children. Uh, you have Mary, who's uh, 18 or 19, and she is a bit of an entrepreneur on her own rights and kind of... At a very young age, she's in Ontario, and she's a cadet. Well, she actually is in the military. She's an officer with the military. She's in RMC, which is Royal Military College. So what the military does is they put them through university. So she's getting her degree in commerce, um, commerce. and history. Yeah. And um, part of they have three pillars. One is the academics, so you have to get your degree. Uh, the second is you have to be bilingual, so you have to be totally bilingual in French. And the other is you have to be athletic and able to do all of the crazy boot yeah. camp stuff. Yeah. So that's what she's busy doing. And so um, she is struggling with her French because that's hard, but in four years she will be bilingual. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. She is top girl in the athletics. Wow. I can't believe it. She's, you've seen her. She's this big. Yeah. You know, but what she did is she did Angel's um, aerials here okay. in town when she, as her sport. So she's very upper body strong. So she, she can get up those walls and right. run as fast as the boy. So we're very, very proud of her. Right. And Liam is in grade 11 and he's working and he's in karate and... You know, he is being a boy. And he's ADHD. He has, we just found that out. We didn't know. Um, we, we thought, but the, the, the teachers didn't, didn't think he did. And so we finally got him tested, um, but also got his IQ tested. And his IQ is 140. Yeah. And that's why he was able to sort of navigate the ADHD until he couldn't. Um, but I say now, he is so lucky. Yeah. Because it's the superpower. 
Well, that's what we have to say is you get it focused. He's just dealing with it now, right? And trying to figure it out and um, and move it to a, being a positive. You're right. It's, it is. Mm-hmm. There is no question yeah. about that. You mm-hmm. know, so uh, it took me a long time. Uh, he's 11 when he found out. I was 67. You yeah. know, so, uh, you know, it took me a little while to... Uh, you know, be in the stigma and the guy in the back of the class, I failed grade three. Nobody mm-hmm. fails grade three and grade yeah. seven three times and, and, yeah. and saying, well, you know, they will put those guys, girls in the back of the class and they uh, are problems. And well, and that's what you become because you're talking, you're doing this, you're distracted. We used to call him and say he had LAS, which is lazy as shit. Yeah. And that's what we we gave him until we realized that he just No, and it was just last year, just at 16 that he got diagnosed. Yeah. yeah. So what I'm going to do yeah. also is sign a book for him. Oh, that would be awesome. July the 8th. You yeah. know, the uh, ADHD unlocked. Yeah. You will love it. It yeah. will become extremely popular, I yeah. believe, you know. So Yeah. And uh, but I always felt, you know, that uh, you know that you know, having gone through that uh, period and, uh, and and the struggles that went along mm-hmm. with it, uh, you know, you know, thinking that I was a failure, mm-hmm. right up to the time that virtually, uh, been in the mid '80s, that's uh, I was already well into my 40s, and I thought I was a failure. Other people say, "Well, you did all these things," and I thought, "No, I failed in yeah. my mind." Well, and at the end of the day, that's what it is. It's it's people can view people. But the lens is really what's the lens you put on yourself, right? Exactly. And if we can create from our, for our children that strength and that confidence and uh, work ethic, then we've succeeded, right? And, exactly. You know, getting that confidence in yourself. Everyone would have looked at you and said, John, are you kidding me? Look, you're successful. You're <laughs> yeah. doing all of that. You know, but it's yeah. our own lens, right? Yeah. And, and, and it is... A superpower that is no yeah. question about that in my mind I could not have done what I did without it yeah you know so uh, and uh, you know but but then at the same time uh, Donna that I you know I started talking about it a little bit more when I uh, about five six seven years ago mm-hmm. uh, and uh, you know that I felt I had an obligation to talk mm-hmm. about it and to write about it at some point and obviously I've done that now yeah. but uh, you know, the, uh, yeah, so I, I, that's the way I It's a about stigma it. too, right? Uh, initially, so, like you don't so want to tell question. people your kid has ADHD, it's whatever. It is what it is, right? We all, everybody has their burden or their thing. And yeah, what doesn't make you, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger, right? Yeah. So, so when I was 58, yeah. I looked at in uh, mm-hmm. books on fourth, actually, and, uh, uh, and, and, uh, I picked up this book and it's uh, driven to distraction. I opened it and I started reading, which I seldom yeah. do. And I was standing there and I thought, oh my God, that's me. Yeah. You know, and I wrote it in there in Dutch because I, I stigma, right? Yeah. So the, there I'm trying to build a lumber company here and, uh, you know, there are people, I'm, 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 going to banks and and trying to get loans and negotiating deals and he's saying the guy has ADHD is mentally broken or whatever mm-hmm. right and, and yeah. so but now that is not there like yeah. it was then and I think the book that I wrote is further uh, you know reducing or eliminating mm-hmm. the stigma from it and saying no no it, it includes about 15, 16 people yeah. that have their experiences in it and uh, it removes part of that stigma and, and focuses on the more positive side of it. Right. You know. So, so uh, where do you go from here? Where because you now, now, you, now you're again in school. Uh, yeah, I am. I yeah. don't know. Well, yeah, kind so, of, well, you are. I am. I'm taking my master's in communication, right? I yeah. think... Um, because that's my job. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I think more than anything is about communicating and getting people 
past yeah. hospice seeing as you know the place people die and trying to get it and market it and understand yeah. it and so yeah. I thought it was important to actually go and understand more about yeah. communication and how important it is exactly um, so yeah so um, where next um, Right now, it's waiting to see where the kids will land, yeah. right? Um, so with Mary in the military, she's not going to land anywhere. But Liam, he goes to university in two years. So waiting and seeing. Um, I have two stepchildren that are actually 20 years older than these two. So I've got a 37-year-old and a 38-year-old that have children. So one's in Ontario, one's in Alberta. So Beautiful. You know, we don't know. We don't know what's next. It's, it's one of those things. What door opens and where will we go through, right? Yeah. It's the courage. Yeah, and, and, and that's why it is so interesting in talking to you because, uh, you know, we've known each other for a long time, already five, six, seven, eight years. Yeah. And obviously, uh, you know, we've been very involved in, uh, in the same ideals and looking forward, mm -hmm. uh, you know, being supportive to the community mm -hmm. and all the things you and mm -hmm. Frank do. And then, uh, you know, and then talking about the fundraising, but also talking about palliative care, what it really mm -hmm. means to people yeah. and how deeply involved you have been in not only here in Prince George, provincially, nationally, and, and bringing that even further into mm -hmm. other areas. And then obviously your family, uh, your kids and, and yeah. Frank. And, uh, you know, but, so. but again, um, we wouldn't have the hospice we have without the community. Yeah. And again, I'm so grateful to, I just look at the support in this room, you know, I'm just so grateful. Yeah. Well, you know, you being a leader and yeah. uh, be uh, has an honor to have you as mm -hmm. my guest. So Donna, that, uh, thank you for having you as uh, my guest. And obviously, uh, you know, we will be the title sponsor this year for the Color Walk. And, and so what we have done, if we have a check for you for $5,000. Oh, thank you so much. Yeah. That's huge. So we so I'll appreciate it. I'll give you a hat once we are yeah. the cameras off. And, uh, thank you. Again. Um, again, you have been such a huge support um, that we couldn't do what we do without you and your team and just having our back right along the way. So, yeah. um, you know, on behalf of hospice and really the community that, you know, benefits from all you do. Thank you. Thanks, Donna. Appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.